Raj and Jessica, I'm working on the Coronavirus Crisis Center, and we're going to talk about the safety of packages and mail delivered to your home. And I also spoke with NBC's chief medical correspondent about the new symptoms people with the virus are now experiencing. But for now, I'll send it back to you two. Okay, thank you, Janelle. We're going to talk to you shortly. The big headline at this hour, Santa Clara County leaders say we could see 2,000 coronavirus deaths in the next 12 weeks. That projection laid out by San Jose's deputy city manager based on data from researchers at Cal and Stanford, and they're calling that number a best case scenario. As of yesterday, Bay Area Health Departments reported more than 1,300 cases over a span of almost three weeks. You see there in the far left, 3-7, that's March 7th, and then all the way to the right of your screen, 3-25, that's March 25th. Let's compare that to the total cases in San Francisco County. The red is the Bay Area, the orange is San Francisco specific. As of yesterday, 178 cases over that same span of time. Now, late today, we confirmed an emergency staff group member at SF General tested positive for the virus. That staff member directly involved in patient care. This isn't the only San Francisco hospital with some serious issues here. Laguna Honda Hospital remains on lockdown after several nurses and a patient tested positive. Here's investigative reporter Jackson Vanderbecken. Here at Laguna Honda Hospital, one resident and several nurses working in two wings, known as the South 4 and South 5 neighborhoods, have tested positive for the coronavirus, along with two hospital cleaners. So now some 150 staff members who work in those wings will be tested, even if they're not showing any symptoms. The two wings where the hospital houses elderly and disabled residents are under lockdown. Deanna Chan is a union leader and occupational therapist at Laguna Honda. She says stress is running high at the facility as personal protective equipment is scarce. It is a very critical situation. Uh, we don't want to unknowingly be spreading this virus as we work. Um, and we want to make sure that all of the frontline workers have access to the correct kind of PPE. In this notice to Laguna Honda Hospital staff, the director says the hospital currently has all the necessary personal protective equipment and supplies required for us to continue caring for residents safely. Meanwhile, 27 investigators and staff of the police department's special victim unit remain under quarantine after two officers tested positive, triggering the head of the police union to write Maryland and Breed, demanding that SFPD officers be tested on demand, given that dozens of officers may have been exposed. This is the tip of the iceberg said Union President Tony Montoya, warning the mayor that the force cannot sustain losing hundreds of officers like NYPD and still protect the safety of San Franciscans. So far, no response from the mayor. Jackson Vanderbecken, NBC Bay Area News. Now, hospitals across California are bracing for a crush of new COVID cases similar to what they are seeing in New York. Good Samaritan Hospital in San Jose says contingency plans are in place and they are stockpiling gear. Today, we got a rare behind the scenes look at the operations of Good Sam. Those brown tents that you're looking at is where patients with COVID-19 symptoms are brought in and assessed to see if they have the virus. The number of patients has been ranging from five to 35 people a day. The hospital's chief of nursing, a former military medic, calls the fight against COVID-19 a different kind of battle. It is a little different when, when you're not exactly sure where it's coming from. Um, it's a very different thing when you're um, in a wartime situation where you can see the enemy and something like this when it is a coronavirus. Mark Brown says that the setup at Good Sam and other hospitals is now starting to look closer to an Army field hospital. And he says staffing and equipment at this juncture is still holding up. Yeah, the fight to beat this disease has many fronts, among them the battle to get that equipment, those life-saving medical supplies. Some Bay Area hospitals are innovating to get the tools that they need. Let's bring in NBC Bay Area's Melissa Colorado, who joins us in Fremont with an inside look. Melissa. Well, Raj, you know this, weddings, celebrations, parties, graduations, they're either getting postponed or canceled because of the coronavirus pandemic. Well, now a local company that rents out party equipment is helping out hospitals, supplying them with tents to help them expand the number of patients they can treat. You know, I originally got in this business to help people celebrate, you know, their life events. 
For Michael Berman, this isn't a call for celebration, it's a call to action. The president of Stewart Event Rentals says his company is renting out tents to 11 hospitals in the Bay Area. Some tents will become coronavirus testing sites. Others will become extensions of the ER as doctors prepare for the possibility of running out of room. So we're working on creating some privacy screens uh, so they can the healthcare providers can move more rapidly with that with uh, within their you know to service their patients. Perhaps no race is as competitive as the race to find N95 masks to protect hospital workers. The SEIU United Healthcare Workers West scored a big find when a spokesperson says the union found a supplier in the East Coast who had a warehouse full of 39 million masks. That supplier sold each mask for $5. Uh, we have now secured literally 100 million new N95 masks. The race to meet the demand for medical supplies is setting off a competition no one wants to be in. States are outbidding one another no to compass. get medical supplies that their hospitals need. And there's calls for the federal government to step in. You're hearing it all across the country from states. They just can't deal with finding the medical supplies that they need. Uh, and that's why I believe the federal government should take over. Speaking of those medical supplies, the governor says that business mogul Richard Branson has promised a Virgin Atlantic flight from Hong Kong to Oakland, and that plane is filled with a million N95 masks as well as 100,000 coronavirus testing kits. That's the latest here in Fremont. I'm Melissa Colorado, NBC, Bay Area News. Melissa, thank you. Just a few miles up the road in Hayward, that testing site continues to see an overflow crowd, and roughly one quarter of the people tested at this free location have have the coronavirus. The city of Hayward says 54 of the 207 people tested this week tested positive. Our NBC Bay Area Sky Ranger was overhead and you can see the line of cars waiting and hoping to get in and get tested. Some people lining up as early as four and five in the morning. People flooding this location. This is at a Hayward fire station. People who don't have a fever. This is important. If you don't have a fever or don't meet certain criteria, you will be turned away. Now, Hayward fire says that's tough and difficult because the CDC has implemented stricter guidelines for testing. They want to know if they're going to be you know, positive or negative. So that's what we're trying to provide. And, you know, we, we're, we, like I said, this, this situation is constantly evolving. So, you know, we can only do what we can do. So what happens once you get tested? Well, those tests then go across the bay to a lab in Menlo Park. That lab is still processing hundreds of tests that were taken earlier this week. The lab has such a backlog that it's only conducting 100 tests per day. Okay, real estate may not be top of mind in the midst of this pandemic, unless, of course, you're the one who needs to sell or buy a house. And while the agents have been staying home along with the rest of us, it doesn't necessarily mean they're actually not showing homes. Our business and tech reporter Scott Budman is live in Santa Clara to show us how tech is helping people keep up with that house hunting, Scott. Yeah, Jessica, and most of the technology involved that we're talking about here can be found on your smartphone. Real estate agents are downloading apps from companies like Zillow to shoot and post videos online. All the better to keep potential buyers interested. There is a nice patio out here. We may not be able to leave our homes, but we can shop for new homes virtually. They're looking and shopping and everyone's more online than ever right now. Real estate agents tell us that, thanks to cell phones, drones, and webcams, people are still touring houses even during the coronavirus lockdown. Well, you can turn to technology that makes things uh, possible that never were possible before. You can put your furniture there, yeah, you can put your pet there, you can scroll through a whole house and look at each bedroom, every angle. Zillow says that even though closing deals is tough, technology is allowing sellers and buyers to stay in touch. We actually saw a 300% increase above what we saw last month uh, of 3D home tour creations on our site. Letting you plan for your next home without leaving your current one. Another incentive for potential home buyers, mortgage rates that have been falling sharply as of late. Also, with so few sales happening, it's likely that we'll see home prices drop in the weeks and months ahead. Live in Santa Clara, Scott Budman, NBC 
Bay Area News. Interesting story. Thank you, Scott. Well, several weeks ago, we started to get flooded with questions about this virus. At that time, we created the Coronavirus Crisis Center, really to try to help answer some of these questions. Now, among them, package delivery or even restaurant deliveries. What should you do when those things get delivered right to your front porch? Let's bring in NBC Bay Area's Janelle Wang, who is working from home. And Janelle, what's the guidance here when it comes to those packages? They are safe, Raj. It's okay to get those packages, even though researchers say that the virus could live up to 24 hours on cardboard and three days on stainless steel and plastic. It's very, very unlikely that your packages and your mail and your food deliveries will spread the virus to you. That's because in all the cases so far, it's found that it's spread through respiratory droplets, person to person, rather than surface contamination. A U.S. Postal Service spokesman says there is currently no evidence that COVID-19 is spread through the mail. The CDC also backs that up, saying the risk is very low and there are no cases linked to contact with packages. But to be safe, wash your hands with soap and water after getting a food delivery or opening a package. And a senior VP at Amazon says you can also leave your package outside or in your garage for a day before bringing it in if you want to be extra cautious. Other people are also wearing disposable gloves, then throwing them away or spraying their package with Lysol uh, or wiping it down with a disinfectant wipe, but those are just overly cautious um, um, tips. It's safe to get your packages. The best thing to do is just wash your hands with soap and water. Raj and Jessica. That yeah. is good. That is good to know. Thank you, Janelle. The answer well, to everything is wash your hands. Yes. Up next here at six o'clock, Curry and Fauci, two very familiar faces. The warrior superstar meets one of the men leading the fight against this disease. What they did and why on Instagram while thousands of people watched. Plus, who's going to take care of the swans at the Palace of Fine Arts? The reason strangers are donating cans of corn now. I'm Chief Meteorologist Jeff Ranieri. A little bit of spotty rain right now, but what about April? I'll give you a look at my long-range forecast over the next 30 days in about six minutes.
basketball superstar and a blossoming humanitarian. Steph Curry is using his social media influence to educate the public about the coronavirus. Today, a heart-to-heart -heart and screen-to-screen -screen chat with Dr. Anthony Fauci. NBC Bay Area's Garvin Thomas was among the thousands of people worldwide watching. A lot of us are looking for ways to help during this crisis while staying at home, using the things we have around the house. Well, you know what Steph Curry has? 30 million Instagram followers. So this morning, he decided to use them to help spread accurate information about the coronavirus. Can y'all hear me? Dr. Fauci. Curry did it with the help of Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and probably the most famous doctor on the planet right now. During their half hour chat on Instagram, a lot of numbers were thrown around, like how coronavirus is 10 times more serious than the flu or how we're 12 to 18 months away from a vaccine. But the most important number was this one. Nearly 50,000 people tuned into the chat. Curry understands his social media audience might not otherwise be getting the most accurate information. And that's really one of the reasons that I wanted to have this Q&A and hopefully reach um, you know, a different demographic or people that, you know, are, are interested in, in, in the facts of, of what's going on. Curry admitted during today's interview that he tested negative for coronavirus a week and a half ago after feeling flu-like symptoms. The system, the way it was set up, step was Fauci here. said he did the right thing, says testing is finally becoming more and more available. And that, Fauci said, will help us get a hold of this virus, but only if everyone's on board. We can start thinking about getting back to some degree of normality when the country as a whole is turn that corner and start coming down. Useful information delivered to people who need it by two of the very best in their very different fields. Garvin Thomas, NBC Bay Area News. Good job, Steph. Okay, no toilet paper, no antiseptic wipes, and apparently no canned corn. Food hoarding isn't just impacting people, animals too. And while the famed swans at San Francisco's iconic Palace of the Fine Arts aren't worried about the wipes or the TP, they are running low on a staple of their diet, corn. NBC Barry's Lily Tan is live in San Francisco, and Lily, the caregivers of the swans, say they need some distance-appropriate help from the public now, though. Oh, absolutely. Caretakers say that corn is crucial for swans at this time of year. It's the way they fatten them up before nesting season. But when they went to the stores, local stores, and suddenly couldn't find any, they panicked. But take a look now, just a day after asking for donations, people have responded, rolling dozens of cans of corn under the fence. During the COVID-19 crisis, it's not only humans struggling to find the necessities. Maybe ten I don't know. <laughs> it's mating season for the swans at San Francisco's Palace of Fine Arts. So this nibbling is actually about territory, not hunger. But 24-year-old Blanche and 13-year-old Blue Boy, aka Swanathan, are at risk of losing a crucial part of their diet, corn, which helps their bodies prepare for nesting. Well, I felt a little panicked at first. Gail Haggerty, the palace's swan caretaker of 25 years posted a message online, noting that because of food hoarding, she couldn't buy necessary corn in bulk. Oh my gosh, we heard on next door that our swans were not able to get the food that they needed because of the shortage. And people responded right away, lobbing or rolling cans of corn beyond the gardener's fence. Uh, the swans needed food, uh, corn in particular, so we decided to bring our last two cans over. An emotional gesture to the Swan's caretaker, who has been in quarantine for the past 10 days after being potentially exposed to COVID-19. I was so happy. Uh, I was like pumping my fist when I saw those cans being put underneath the fence for the birds. It's just really heartwarming. Many more donations have rolled in 
throughout the day. The gardener will actually collect these and feed the swans while the caretaker is still in quarantine. And in, an important note before we go, the caretaker says anyone is welcome to donate, but please do not feed the swans or any other animals here directly. We're live in San Francisco, Lily Tan, NBC Bay Area News. Yeah, we want to make sure that they're, they stay beautiful and safe. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Lily. Let's bring in our chief meteorologist, Jeff Ranieri. And Jeff and Jessica, usually on Thursday, we say, okay, the weekend is around the corner, but all these days kind of just blend into each other now, right? Yes. They all feel like the weekend, sort of. I know. I, you know, I was thinking, right? Uh, but, you know, maybe at least this weekend, you guys, we can take a break from the homeschooling and the work from home for some of us, yeah. maybe, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so weekend might still have a little bit of that meaning for you if you just are going to be trying to step away from that homeschooling. And there's going to be some changes as we hit Saturday and also on Sunday's forecast. Let's bring you in right now, though, to that look at the dot live Doppler radar and also satellite view. And we have some spotty showers today with some isolated small hair will Ports and some low snow down to about 3,000 feet. As we zoom in closer, I'm doing all of this from home. Once again, we have the same computers here at my house that we have back at the station, and you'll see some showers over downtown San Jose. This is tracking off towards the south. That could continue some moderate rain down to Alamitos through 655 tonight. I do think dry weather returns on Friday's forecast, so we'll go for a partly cloudy sky. Notice our temperatures here for the morning, 30s to 40s to start and partly cloudy through the afternoon. I've also warmed up those temps to the upper 50s and low 60s from the North Bay down to the South Bay. Now, I don't want to pile on. I know a lot of us are dealing with COVID-19, the shelter in place, but we did get our new drought monitor update today. We have moderate drought that's returned to parts of the Bay Area, so we're continuing to monitor that. But I did think that you guys would be interested in the long-range outlook. So here's a preview of that. Right now, no El Nino or La Nina. We're considered uh, neutral at this point. Chance of weekend rain on the way, and right now I'm calling for a 70% chance of more rain in April with some on and off storm systems. I'll take a look at the weekend rain chances and what's coming our way. I'll have that in about 25 minutes. Uh, so Raj, I, I think it's still okay. We can still be uh, pumped up about that weekend. You too, Jess. Right? All right. Thank you for Slow bringing bit. a smile to our face. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Well, we all we know a fever okay. and dry cough are signs of the coronavirus, but what are some possible other symptoms? We're going to talk to NBC's chief medical correspondent next.
I'm Janelle Wang reporting from home. As we know, there are three main symptoms of the coronavirus, dry cough, shortness of breath, and fever. But there are also some non-classic symptoms we're learning about. Here's Dr. John Torres. He's an emergency room doctor and an NBC News medical correspondent. People start to lose their sense of smell and their sense of taste. We think the reason this is happening is because the virus gets up into their nose area where they have those smell nerve receptors. It occupies those nerve receptors and ends up deadening them for a while, so they lose that sense of smell and taste. I think I another one. The, the non-classic symptoms that you see are headache, gastrointestinal problems, this uh, smell issue, and then pink eye is another one. It doesn't happen in many cases, and in the studies they did, it was less than 1%, and it came with other symptoms, but we know it's a virus that can get into the eyes, and people start getting redness to the eyes, they start getting eye discharge. It's another reason we say you want to make sure you wash your hands before you touch your face, particularly your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. So again, that pink eye symptom is extremely rare, maybe on 1%, and it usually is going along with other symptoms of the coronavirus. But this loss of taste and smell, a lot of people are experiencing that. Doctors in South Korea say 30% of their patients are losing their sense of taste and smell. But in all those cases, the patients got those um, sensory sensories and their sensory back. The, the, they didn't lose their taste and smell forever. They all came back eventually. So that is good to hear. Raj yeah. and Jessica? That is comforting. All right, thank you, Janelle. Well, up next at 6.30, establishing new guidelines for the coronavirus. President Trump's plan to get communities back up and running. Also, he's been an economic advisor for several U.S. presidents. So what does Robert Reich think about this stimulus package? We'll tell you right now, he thinks the American public is getting robbed. He joins us next. Right now at 6.30, the United States has passed a grim milestone. More than 1,000 deaths have been reported across the country from COVID-19. And we have more cases than China. As this pandemic worsens, President Trump is dealing with all the factors. Today, Jessica, he said his administration is developing new guidelines that would rate each individual county across the, across the country. Yeah, that tiered system would categorize counties into high risk, medium risk, and low risk. 
The expectation is the guidelines would help governors and mayors decide if they want to maintain, increase, or relax their social distancing rules. Sections of our country, we may take large sections of our country that aren't so seriously affected, and we may do it that way, but uh, we've got to start the process pretty soon. Public health experts have said that easing social distancing restrictions too soon could overburden hospitals and eventually lead to more deaths and more economic damage related to the virus. Now, record-breaking, that's the way to describe the unemployment surge in the U.S. right now. Three million Americans filed for unemployment last week. And it comes as the Senate approves that $2 trillion emergency relief plan. The bill now heads to the House. Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, says they will vote tomorrow. It will pass with a strong bipartisan support. Let's do it in a way that stays focused on the kitchen tables of America's families. The bill includes billions of dollars for hospitals and small businesses. It also funds $1,200 checks the president has been talking about. Those checks will be sent by mail or direct deposit to people making less than $75,000 a year. There's a formula for that for couples and for children. The Treasury Secretary says the checks will be sent out within three weeks and that you don't need to sign up for anything as long as you've been working and paying taxes since 2018. Those unemployment numbers didn't slow down Wall Street. The Dow soared for a third straight day, but the markets are still down overall nearly 20% over the past month. The optimism on Wall Street is because of the bailout. The Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ, you can see all in green uh, with positive numbers. Well, all this money about to be spent and all those people losing their jobs, are we doing the right thing with that $2 trillion? The short answer, no. That's according to Robert Reich. He's a familiar face in the Bay Area and in Washington, D.C. Reich is the former labor secretary for President Clinton and a public policy professor at UC Berkeley. He tweeted, quote, no industry, not airlines, not hotels, not cruise ships should be bailed out. They can stay in business by borrowing at rock bottom rates using their assets as collateral. Uh, joining us now from Berkeley is Professor Rice. Robert, nice to have you back on the program. Let's not waste any time. Let's get right to it. You are not happy with the way we're going to spend this $2 trillion. How come? Well, there's, there's some good things in the bill, but the, the biggest expenditure is for corporations bailing out big airlines and cruise ship operators and hotels and the like. They don't need to be bailed out. Uh, that's wasted money. We need to spend every dollar we have on people, on the people who need it, on uh, individuals who are home, and they should be home, they should be safe, uh, but they need income in order to get through this. And that's where the federal taxpayer dollars ought to be going. Just from a layman's term, if the corporations get help, therefore they can keep hiring and keep their employees. Is that correct? Uh, well, there's nothing in the bill that requires most corporations to keep hiring. In fact, there's nothing in the bill that requires most corporations to maintain existing employment. Uh, there's barely anything in the bill that sets a cap to executive pay, CEO pay. Uh, and like we learned during the bailout of, the, uh, of Wall Street in 2008, uh, those CEOs uh, get paid a lot of money, and that's taxpayer dollars going directly into their pockets. You brought up 2008. That was uh, President Obama. That was the Democrats fighting for that bailout of the auto industry. Uh, and now how come we can't bail out the airline industry? They are job providers, are they not? Well, the airline industry actually is a, is a job provider if they agreed to keep all of their employees on. Industries, generally speaking, are not uh, agreeing to doing anything like this. Uh, that's one of the problems with the bailout. We're, we're, we're just going to be paying businesses, large businesses, uh, to stay afloat. Where those businesses have been using uh, the tax break that they got in 20, the, the end of 2017 to buy back their shares of stock, nothing trickled down. Uh, in fact, what we saw from the Wall Street bailout of 2008 and the big Trump tax cut of 2017, 2018, uh, is that when you give big, big amounts of money to big corporations, nothing trickles down. And that's going to be the same thing now. Why pay $500 billion to these big corporations? They can take care of themselves. Uh, they can certainly negotiate with their creditors. We're not going to lose the airline industry or the cruise ship industry or, or big hotel chains. 
uh, they're going to do quite well. You're the former Secretary of Labor for President Clinton. You know the inner workings here. 3.2 million people filed for unemployment just last week. A big chunk of those people are here in California. When are we going to get our jobs back? That's just the big question. Am I going to get my job back in a month, six months, or will it ever come back? Uh, well, it probably, I, I assume that the jobs will come back, but I think that the real question is making sure that you get money right now uh, to take care of yourself and your family. Uh, and the primary objective here is not to get the job back. The primary objective is to be safe from this virus, uh, to stop the virus from growing at a rate that makes it impossible for people to get the health care and the medical assistance they need. The number one goal here is to fight this coronavirus. Uh, not to revive the economy. Is it enough, whether it's $1,200 in our pockets, $2,400 in our pockets, or $6,000 in our pocket, is, is it enough for individuals to get back on track, and when will they? Well, it's not enough. $1,200, one-time payment of $1,200 is not enough. Uh, the part of the new bill that has to do with unemployment insurance is much better, but even that is going to be not enough because most people who are looking at this, and I'm talking about public health officials and epidemiologists, they have been telling us that this is going to last for several months, maybe three or four, possibly five months. And the most important thing is to, as I said, get people the kind of in income support they need, as well as the medical help, if they do need medical help, the medical help they need, uh, not to worry about companies right now. Uh, so I, I expect that $2 trillion, it sounds like a lot, but it probably is going to be the, just the first tranche if we take this seriously and understand what we have to do. Remember, this is a $21 trillion economy per year. Normally, we can afford to make sure that all of our citizens are safe during this economic and public health emergency. Robert, thank you for your time. Thank you for your insight. We look forward to our next conversation. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Up next, the VTA training trainee tests positive for the coronavirus, what it means for light rail trains in the South Bay. Two Tesla employees have tested positive for COVID-19. A company-wide email sent to the staff did not disclose the workers' locations or their specific job functions. This comes, though, after Tesla essentially shut down its Fremont factory after days of back and forth with the Alameda County Sheriff, whether Tesla is considered an essential business. 32 people in the Bay Area have lost their lives to COVID-19, and among them is a South Bay woman. Araceli Martinez was a loving mother and grandmother. Her family 
family says she would have given you her last dollar. She loved to cook for a house full of people while doting on her grandkids. Now, she worked at a Food Max grocery store in San Jose. After testing positive, that sh store was shut down so it could be cleaned. She got the virus while traveling and hadn't worked since March 6. After returning home from Disneyland, her daughter said she rushed her to the hospital, and Mrs. Martinez never came back home. She was my best friend, my daughter's best friend. Um, she always gave me the best advice and loved me unconditionally. We spent all of our time together. Her family did tell us that she did have an underlying condition. Araceli was insulin dependent. Those are heartbreaking stories there. Well, this could impact a lot of essential workers. VTA is now shut down all light rail service because a worker tested positive. All the trains are parked and being deep cleaned before returning to service. Now, 60 employees, including operators, trainees, and maintenance workers, are now home for the time being. The agency says it's doing all it can uh, to keep riders safe. We have a, a, an essential service that we provide, and we need everybody to do their part to ensure the safety of, of all the public and our operators. No word yet on when light rail service will resume, but you can see here VTA bus service is still operating. Okay, a lot of us have been asking this, this question and wondering, will you develop immunity to COVID-19 if you get it? That's the question doctors are trying to answer. There are many people who experienced flu-like symptoms before doctors began detecting the virus in the U.S. And now doctors are wondering if some of those people actually had the virus. One doctor told us that's hard to say since there isn't an antibody yet to test it. We know from the four common cold viruses that you develop immunity, but it's not long lasting so that you can get infected over and over again. So we're thinking if this is like the common cold virus, and again, as I said, we don't know that for sure yet. And that's a big push to try to figure that out is that will we need to get an annual vaccine, for example. Dr. Maldonado told us Stanford is working on getting a reliable antibody test within weeks, but it may take months. Let's get a smile on our face, bring in our chief meteorologist, Jeff Ranieri, working from home in the East Bay. When's a good time? Rain or shine, we don't care. Just to get out and go for a walk, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, I think it's going to be good for the kids for recess, the parents for maybe some uh, early exercising in the morning, and uh, we'll show you when some weekend rain moves in and out. I'll get you all ready to go here in about six minutes. The public health folks say it's a good idea to have some extra medicine on hand, but getting that accomplished, well, you might run into a hurdle. I'm consumer investigator Chris Kamara. We'll help you get over it after this break.
Okay, as we shelter at home for the next few weeks, one thing to keep an eye on is your supply of prescription medicine. Consumer investigator Chris Kimura has one viewer's challenge how to overcome that potential limit. They only let you get sometimes a month at a time. So then what happens? Well, I'm going to show you what you need to do. Basically, pick up the phone and call your insurance company. The stay-at-home order allows you to make trips to the pharmacy, but say you want to limit those trips for your safety and stock up. Well, fair warning, yeah, you might face a hurdle like Alexander did. Here's what he told us. Us on Twitter. Just a heads up, I called my pharmacy to get my prescriptions refilled. My pharmacist tells me that my insurance doesn't allow for refills if it's within 25 days of my last refill. Well, refill prescriptions, restrictions rather, are ordinarily in place to limit abuse, but the rules can be bypassed. And here's how you call your health insurance and you request this a prescription override that will let the pharmacist temporarily increase your supply basically same as requesting an extra refill before a long trip the key lingo here is to use this phrase right here prescription override now you might get the green light instantly but the prescription website GoodRx cautions that some health plans might require an exception form or authorization from your doctor so give yourself some time to jump through these hoops GoodRx says the exception process can sometimes take about three days I'm happy to report Alexander followed up and said he was ultimately able to successfully get that override we're taking virus related questions each day send yours via our website go to nbcbayarea.com click the main menu and then respond or you can call us the number is 888-996-TIPS coming up in just a couple minutes at seven we're going to dive into data about the products people are panic buying right now and where they're spending all that money Raj? okay chris we'll see you in just a few minutes well all those weekend visitors that we saw last weekend have led to more changes at some of our most popular bay area spots a lot of notable areas will remain closed, including Muir Woods, Alcatraz, and Land's End. No word yet on when those sites will reopen. Some trails will remain accessible, but park rangers ask that you follow, you know this now, social distancing guidelines. All right, let's bring in Chief Meteorologist Jeff Ranieri working from home. So, Jeff, if we go out tomorrow or this weekend, go around the block, yes. go to your local park, take your dog for a walk, and just keep your distance. Yes. Exactly. It's going to be a really, really nice day for your dogs. Lucy was a little shy in the five, but we thought we'd give her another little opportunity to say hi to everybody <laughs> at home. We've got some uh, great weather coming our way as we head through tomorrow. If you do want to get outside, as Jessica said, uh, and take your dog for a walk or go for a jog yourself, just remember that social distancing. As we get a closer look at the Doppler radar on satellite, we have started to see a few spotty showers moving in across the Bay Area this afternoon. Nothing Nothing overly heavy, uh, but as you'll see as we zoom in on this, uh, most of the activity has been right down towards the South Bay. Uh, some scattered showers over San Jose, also Morgan Hill and Gilroy, even getting in on a little bout of some heavier rainfall. And this will continue here, uh, certainly as we head through the next 30 to 45 minutes uh, down over Gilroy. But I do expect dry weather to return on Friday. It's going to be a short break before we get some weekend rain in here. Uh, the next thing we'll also look ahead towards is some cold weather tomorrow. So if you are headed out in the front or the backyard to just get some fresh air tomorrow morning or a little bit of a jog around your house, uh, temperatures will be in the 30s for the Tri-Valley, 42 in the South Bay. We'll have a mix of sun and clouds, and down as cold as 37 for the North Bay and 39 in the East Bay. Temperatures for tomorrow afternoon, I do see them warming by about two to five degrees. So uh, it'll be slightly warmer. I think it'll be noticeable down here uh, through the South Bay with 60 in San Jose, also 59 in Cupertino, and a little bit breezy. Winds out of the Northwest at 14, and that really could be the only problem in the forecast tomorrow. It if you have allergies, this wind we're seeing through our microclimates definitely could aggravate them. For the East Bay, it's going to be up to 17 miles per hour. The peninsula 59 in Palo Alto, then right up to Daly City, 54 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, I have 58 in the Mission and 55 for the Marina. And as we move up to the North Bay, 62 in Napa, then down to Mill Valley, 57. So tomorrow's a quick break in the weather 
with that dry weather. But then by this weekend, I wanted to show you when we'll see some rain starting to move in. And you'll see at 7 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, we have showers moving right up against the coastline. Then as we move through the day on Saturday, we'll continue with this chance of rain back in the mix. Let's spend some time on that extended forecast because really with COVID-19, everybody's sheltering in place. Anytime we can get some sunshine, it is going to be good. So we already talked about that chance of rain on Saturday and Sunday. We're looking at about a quarter inch on average uh, for Saturday and Sunday. But then once we hit next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, it appears that we will have some sunshine coming back in the way the forecast is moving right now. I really think next Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday are going to be the best days out of the next seven with temperatures in the low to mid 70s. Now, notice by next Thursday, I do drop it down to 69. We might see a storm system approach from the north by next Thursday. It's too early to tell if we'd get rainfall right now. So I'd say the best thing to uh, enjoy here is next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. You got those low to mid 70s, as I said yesterday. Uh, being cooped in so much inside, I'm, I'm ready to get the chair out and some SPF 30. Go sit in it with some sunglasses and a magazine. Of course, on my NBC work approved break only and uh, get some uh, vitamin D for Mother Nature. <laughs> Uh, I did see Jeff on his Facebook you know? Live today. He looked great outside in the backyard talking about the weather, but 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 love it, but loving it. <laughs> Good to see you, Jeff. During work hours. <laughs> yeah, I did a workout at home. I have some advice for people at home, you guys. I wore the wrong shoes during the workout because I'm not at the gym. I didn't put the tennis shoes on. Not a good idea. Oh. Not a good idea. <laughs> see you later, Jeff. <laughs> well, the sound of silence at our Bay Area ballparks. And across the country, what was supposed to be baseball's opening day, there's still a way, though, you can enjoy the game. Anthony Flores joins us next. Okay, Jessica, what do we do every day or every time this year what? on this day? 
I have popcorn and a hot dog. We do, and we say Happy <laughs> New Year. Yeah. It was supposed to be opening day in baseball for the A's and the Giants and everyone else, but no games. But it doesn't mean the sights and sounds of the game are gone. And you have to make your own hot dog. <laughs> NBC Bears' Anthony Flores explains how the A's are bringing the game to the fans anyway. This was supposed to be a day of celebration across the country, opening day in baseball. Instead, stadiums like the Coliseum here in Oakland are empty. Major League Baseball is delaying the start of the season over concerns about the spread of the coronavirus. Today was supposed to be the start of a seven-game homestand in Oakland, but no one's in the parking lot, the seats, or on the diamond. Across the bay, the Giants were scheduled to open the season on the road, returning home on April 3rd. But the start of the season is on hold, at least until mid-May, with the possibility of being pushed back even later. We haven't seen something like this since 1995, following a seven and a half month player strike. But well, the A's are loose and ready to go for. Since game. they can't go to the Coliseum, the A's are bringing the excitement to their fans. We're all going through tough times here, and I think you have to be creative finding. Um, new means of entertainment. Head to the bottom of the first inning. Adeline ropes the ball towards left center field. The team's announcers are doing play-by-play -play of fan videos. Canelo the dog decides to play some defense. Playing catch. Buddies will have their ace on the mound tonight. Polini throwing heat from the mound and of course going yard. And the pitch and that is crushed to deep center field. Way back and that ball is gone. With a home run call from Ken Korak. It's all about linking people right now, and I think reaching out and, and doing what we can to try to uh, get people together. If the kids get a kick out of it, and my sense is people have enjoyed it from that standpoint, if this is a vehicle for them to have some fun, then I'm all for it. And who knows? Maybe the A's will find a future star. In Oakland, Anthony Flores, NBC, Bay Area. <laughs> it looks like he's having fun. Okay, doing something good and creative in the most difficult of times. Okay, this is about Harry. He's being treated for COVID-19 at El Camino Hospital Mountain View this morning. His son organized a car parade to raise his spirits. Lots of Harry's friends got in their cars and drove to the hospital, surprised him through his window. Some of the cars decorated to help bring a smile to Harry's face. That is so cool to see. All those cars, you see all those signs there, and you can see them. In the hospital saying, you know what, I see all my friends out there. I know, and they know he's in that way. He knows he's loved and that he's being thought of. That is very nice. We are not done. Stay with us for a special edition of NBC Bay Area News at 7 o'clock. And Jessica, I think you're talking with the local vet on yes. how to treat our, our, our dogs right now. Right, what to do with our pets. We'll see you in just a minute. Thanks for joining us.
where we're doing record numbers of tests now, far more than any other country. Right now at 7 o'clock, the United States passes China when it comes to coronavirus cases. The Bay Area is no exception. Hospitals are gearing up. We go behind the scenes tonight and on the front lines. Good evening and thanks for being with us on this special 7 p.m. newscast. I'm Raj Mathai. And I'm Jessica Aguirre. We're also joined by Janelle Wang, who is working from home. Janelle. Yeah, I'm working on a lot of things from home, including how to stay active and healthy because we are all stuck at home. So if you are running out of ideas, I've got some for you. I'm going to share what our viewers sent to me. That's coming up in about 10 minutes. Okay, Janelle, thank you. We'll check back with you in just a few minutes. Let's tell you what's happening at this hour. Let's start with the latest local projection now. San Jose city leaders say we could see 2,000 coronavirus deaths in Santa Clara County in the next 12 weeks. That is a staggering number. That was laid out today by San Jose's deputy city manager based on data from researchers at Cal and Stanford. They're calling the number a best case scenario. As of yesterday now, Bay Area Health Departments reported more than 1,300 cases over a span of almost three weeks. You see this graph here, 3-7 on the far left, that's March 7th, all the way to the far right, 325 on the lower part of your screen, that's March 25th. Let's compare that to the total cases in Santa Clara County. The red is the Bay Area, the orange is Santa Clara County specifically. As of yesterday, 459 cases over that same span of time. That's more than a third of the cases in the Bay Area. Let's bring in NBC Bay Area's Damien Trujillo at Good Sam Hospital in Santa Clara County in San Jose. Right there, Damien, on the front lines. Well, Rod, it's been nonstop for the doctors and nurses here at Good Sam. Uh, right now, it's been just a steady flow of patient after patient with face masks coming in here, getting screened uh, for possible uh, COVID-19. Uh, the chief of nursing here told me this is as serious as it gets. Uh, emergency care technician that's out there. Mark Brown took some time out of his amazingly busy schedule to show us what they're doing at Good Samaritan Hospital. So this is specifically screening for anybody who's coming in with um, signs and symptoms that they think that they have a, a, a COVID-19 possible exposure. Mark is the chief nursing officer and a former Army medic. The 11-year Army veteran likens a setup at Good Sam to a MASH unit. Um, I've been in MASH casualty incidents before. Most of that was around trauma. Um, but as far as a, a pandemic in this situation, yeah, that's, that's pretty close to what it's like. Anywhere from 5 to 35 patients with suspected COVID make it into these tents every day. Mark says this battle is different than what he saw before because in the Army he could see the enemy. But in this pandemic, the enemy is invisible. It, it is a little different when, when you're not exactly sure where it's coming from. Um, it's a very different thing when you're... Um, in a wartime situation where you can see the enemy and something like this when it is a coronavirus. For privacy reasons, Good Sam can't say how many COVID positive patients they're treating right now, but there is no hiding the stress level here. Technicians check the temperatures of everyone coming in. Only one family member is allowed in the ER with the patient. Then there's this, strangers dropping off food and snacks for the staff. A small thank you for their tireless work on this battlefield that's now stretching from sea to sea. And Good Sam is preparing for a possible surge in COVID-19 cases, but they say that surge can be avoidable if people stay home and they self-isolate and give these folks a hand. We're live in San Jose. I'm Damian Trujillo, NBC Bay Area. News. It is a difficult situation. Thank you, Damian. Not one, but... Nurses at two Bay Area hospitals rallied today at Oakland Highland Hospital, San Francisco St. Mary's Medical Center, sending a message that they need more personal protective equipment. The nurses say they need the essentials like the N95 masks, the face shields and gloves before they get a surge of patients. If nurses can't be protected, we can't protect you. If nurses get sick, there will be nobody to take care of you. And we believe that we need the highest protection. So this is what they're asking if you have gloves, masks, hand sanitizer, that you can donate them to your local hospital. Now, states across the country are scrambling to get their hands on medical supplies, sometimes outbidding one another for the equipment. In some cases, hospitals in the Bay Area are turning to some unusual places to get the stuff they need. Stort Event Rentals is, using, is used to pitching tents for galas and weddings, but because of the coronavirus pandemic, the company is now setting up tents for 11 hospitals in the Bay Area. And those tents are becoming coronavirus testing sites. Others will help treat an overflow of patients coming into the ER.
What we want to do is get back to celebrations as quickly as we can. And, you know, as soon as we can flatten that curve, that's going to get us, uh, you know, back to business as usual. And in that race to find that N95 mask to protect the nurses, a union that represents health care workers on the West Coast scored a big win. The union found a supplier in the East Coast who had a warehouse full of 39 million N95 masks. It's worth noting the supplier sold each mask for $5. The same mask were $1 to $2 eight months ago. Well, we've been talking a lot about that test site in Hayward. It continues to see an overflow crowd and roughly one quarter of the people tested and it's that free site there have COVID-19. The city of Hayward says 54 of the 207 people tested this week tested positive. Now, since it opened on Monday, this is what we've seen. Just a lot of cars and a lot of people flooding this testing location, which is at a Hayward fire station. You can see the backup of cars. In fact, some people this morning started lining up at 4 a.m. Uh, people who don't have a fever or meet certain criteria, you'll be turned away. Hayward Fire says that's difficult because the CDC has implemented even stricter guidelines now for testing. They want to know if they're going to be you know, positive or negative. So that's what we're trying to provide. And, you know, we, we're, we, like I said, this, this situation is constantly evolving. So, you know, we can only do what we can do. So here's what's happening. They're taking, they're taking all those tests and sending it to a lab across the bay in Menlo Park. That lab is still processing hundreds of tests that were taken earlier this week. The lab has such a backlog that it's only conducting 100 tests each day. It is not what we wanted, but the U.S. has surpassed a grim milestone. The country now has more cases than any other country in the world. That includes China and Italy. Two of the hardest hit countries. More than a thousand deaths have been reported across the U.S. At today's news briefing, the president said the number of cases is due to the level of testing that's been done around the country. But I think it's a tribute to the testing. We're testing tremendous numbers of people. And uh... today, China said it could close its borders to nearly all travelers and cut international flights to try and stop that virus from returning back to that country. Well, Jessica, here's a story that many people are not aware of. Thousands of Americans, as we speak, are stuck overseas. They are frustrated, and many of them are scared, wondering why more U.S. military planes aren't bringing them home. For example, San Jose resident Cristel Guadalupe, her sister and her father were on vacation in Peru when the borders closed on March 15th. Here's some photos from what was a magical vacation. She doesn't know, though, when she's going to get home. In fact, we have Cristel Guadalupe, who joins us now from Lima, Peru. Cristel, uh, nice to see you. Uh, can you tell me what's the status? Where are you right now? And when can you get back here to the Bay Area? Hi, Raj. Um, thank you uh, for putting light on this matter. Yes, as of today, we really don't know when we will get back. Um, right now, uh, many, me, I'm one of like 4,000 left um, Americans here in Peru, and we really don't know. Um, the embassy has made um, it known that we are, we should be getting um, repatriated back to the U.S., but there's really no time frame. Um, and then the people that have been able to make it out, it seems like it's been only maybe like two airplanes that can leave. Um, the country by day and so it seems like it's a very slow process. It's almost like you're waiting to win the lottery here and so it's very um, heartbreaking and it's just very, it's a very anxious time right now. It's just very, very sad. I, I can imagine. And Christelle, tell me, what's the process? Every morning you wake up and you call the local embassy there, or the State Department, what's your process every day? Um, well, every day you just have to check your email um, and then the embassy will contact you, some people from, so I'm on several different chat rooms, including Facebook, WhatsApp, and Telegram, and, and a lot of, um, well, all of us here have just tried to, like, unify and see, like, spread the news as to what everybody's um, experience is like, and we basically either wait for a phone call or an email from the embassy, um, and it could be as late as 11.49 saying to be ready at the, air, at the embassy at 8 a.m., or you're just waiting to get that call, so we really don't know when... Um, when you're going to hear it. But yeah, you wake up, you check your email, you wait for phone calls. Um, there's every day it seems like there's a new form to complete. Um, we've completed everything from. Oh, we still have you, Christelle. We know uh, you're joining program, us live from uh, the embassy. 
Uh, hang tight. Sorry to interrupt yes, you, Christelle. We know you're joining us live from uh, Lima, Peru. Uh, we froze up there for a moment. Uh, tell me now, where are you? And you said thousands of Americans are there. Uh, we understand you're at a home, but where is everyone else? Are the hotels or hostels? <clears throat> if you're not in somebody's home, then um, a lot of people are also in Cusco, and then there's the Quitos, and then there's also other parts of Peru where are more um, that are more distant, that are harder to get to, and people are just stranded there. And if you're not in a family's home, then you are in a hostel or you are staying in hotels, and people are having to pay for those day to day and just having those daily expenses. And Peru also has a self quarantine where you're not allowed to leave your home after 8 p.m. Um, or before, or yeah, before at 5, 5 a.m. So it's getting harder to go to the grocery stores and just. Um, you know, just find your daily necessities. You're basically stuck in a foreign place inside a hotel or in, in a building, and it's just not um, a pleasant experience anymore. And we're not getting a lot of support, um, at least nothing that's transparent. Like, we just want transparency to see when we will be able to get back home. We can see some of the videos and photos that you've shared with us. Uh, Christelle, we appreciate your time. We wish you the best. We will stay in contact with you to find out when you finally arrive back to San Francisco or San Jose, and we'll be there perhaps to, uh, to, to be there at the airport to welcome you back home. Thank you, Christelle Guadalupe and her family from Lima, Thank you. Peru. Well, we have created the coronavirus crisis center to answer some of those frequently asked questions that you have about what's going on. We get so many questions, Jessica, right? I mean, the newsroom just around the community. Let's bring in NBC Bay Area's Janelle Wang working from home. Uh, and we're talking about just packages or maybe even restaurant delivery coming to that front porch. What's the guidance here? I have to admit, I have a lot of packages coming uh, to my house because I'm just ordering everything online, things for my daughter, as well as food and groceries. Uh, it's kind of the new normal now, so people are a little bit worried about if those packages have the coronavirus. Well, we do know from the CDC that the virus could live up to 24 hours on cardboard, could, and up to three days on stainless steel and plastic. But they say it's very unlikely that the virus will be transferred uh, to you through mail or packages. Uh, they say there are no evidence, there's no cases that COVID-19 is spread through the mail. The CDC says the risk is so low and no cases are linked to contact from packages. But to be safe, just wash your hands with soap and water after opening the packages. And a senior VP at Amazon says since the virus could live on cardboard for 24 hours, you could leave your package outside for 24 hours or in your garage before bringing it in. And I know, Jessica, you spray your packages with Lysol. Some people use disinfectant wipes or take gloves and then just throw it away afterwards. That's just being overly cautious. They say it is safe to receive packages and deliveries at your house. I'm also receiving a lot of pictures from viewers at home about how they're staying active and healthy because a lot of the things outside, the outdoor playgrounds and stuff, tennis courts are all shut down. So we're going to show that to you a little bit later in our newscast. And getting back to Jessica, she leads our newsroom in cleanliness. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and in doing weird workouts in my house, too. We'll check back with you in just a while. Up next here at 7 o'clock, we've seen all those long lines and empty shelves, but what are people buying? The most popular purchase that is it's not toilet paper. And are you worried about your pet during the outbreak? Of course you are. We're going to get advice from veterinarian how to keep them safe and what to do if you get sick. Well, across the country and, of course, here in the Bay Area, families continue to stock up. I've been buying a lot of uh, frozen pizzas and progressive. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, a fresh batch of data shows how much sales have really skyrocketed. Consumer investigator Chris Kimura has the new numbers plus a look at what people are buying. I have to say my teenagers are buying a lot of ice cream. I don't know how essential that is, but we have a lot of that at my house. I'm going to put that low on the priority oh, okay, list. Okay, thanks. But it does taste good. All right, so this glimpse into people's grocery baskets or buggies or carts or whatever you call them. It is courtesy of a company called Ibotta. It's an app that offers shoppers cash back rebates. Lots of people use it. Ibotta says it looked at 33 and a half million of its users receipts for trips to the supermarket between mid-January and mid-March. And here's what the numbers show. We're going to the grocery store less often. In January, Ibotta saw visits every three days or so. Now there's about a seven day gap between food, food runs. Ibotta CEO Brian Leach says online grocery ordering has shot through the roof. Yes, it's typically around 4% of groceries are purchased online in the United States in a normal year, in a normal month. We're seeing some data that suggests it's over 20% in major metro areas. So that's a five-fold increase. And Leach says we are spending more money. Ibotta's data shows we're spending $50 per visit. That's up from roughly $25 two months ago. Ibotta can quantify the puzzling run on toilet paper. Its users' toilet tissue purchases have doubled. Leach guesses that number would be higher if there were more supply on the shelves. What else are we buying more of? Booze. Vodka sales up 50%. Domestic beer, 48%. And tequila shooting up 42%. And it's not just groceries we're flocking to buy online. Ibotta found 8% more people are shopping on their computers and smartphones. The amount of people, the amount people are spending has shot up 52%. Now, the federal government has backed off its recommendation to store a two-week supply of food and medicine. Right here, you can see it on our screen. Ready.gov used to say two-week supply. Now it says store additional supplies of food and water. So that has been walked back a little bit. That hopefully is reassuring. We also have gotten assurances from growers and food suppliers that the food supply and those essential supply chains, they are up and they are running. We are taking your virus questions. Send yours on NBCBayArea.com. Click the main menu, then responds or give us a call. The number is 888-996-TIPS. Jess, back to you. Good luck with the ice cream. Okay, thank you. And make sure you have dog food and cat food too. Okay, they are part of our family and they are isolating right alongside with us. But what happens to you uh, what happens to your pet if you get sick? And can your dog or cat carry COVID-19? And what's going on with pet adoptions at local shelters during this shelter at home period for the humans? To help us sort all of this out is Dr. Jennifer Scarlett, president of the San Francisco SPCA. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today. I have to say my dog Luca is delighted that this is going on because he's never had so much <laughs> attention and so many people in the house at once. So he's loving this. But here, let's start with something that people uh, keep asking. Asking, can a pet carry the virus on their fur? We've heard that. Um, it's highly unlikely. Um, you know, there's there's an abundance of caution, but it's very, very unlikely that um, a cat or dog is going to carry the virus um, on its fur. I mean, it's all about amount and timing, but it is a very, very low probability. Okay, two scenarios. In our house, there's a bunch of us, so if one person gets sick, there's potential that somebody could take care of Luca and they would, I assume, isolate him away from that person. But what if you live alone and you're the only caretaker for your animal? Well, this is probably the most important question and, and piece of information that I can give. Um, one is for every pet owner in the Bay Area and whoever's listening, is make a plan. We, we know from previous disasters that people won't get themselves to safety if they're worried about whether or not um, their pet is gonna be okay. So make a plan for your pet. If you're feeling okay, you're not hospitalized, then you wanna limit those interactions just as you would another family member in the house. Should you get like extra food for your pet, have all that stuff ready so that literally you can have someone else come and get your dog or your cat? You should, and you should make a list of all medications, just as you would for your to-go bag, so that um, should you be hospitalized or need to leave your pet, someone can come and, and easily take them, take them in and take care of them. Is there a potential that I could get my dog or my cat sick? Not from COVID. Um, you know, there's no evidence um, to show that animals uh, acquire COVID um, or transmit it to people. So during this time, nothing is open. We're seeing that just the basics are open, like grocery stores. Are, are mm. veterinarians operating? What if my dog needs some other type of veterinary care? Mm. What do we do then? 
Um, so many veterinarians are open for essential services only. We have two hospitals that are here for just urgent and emergency care. And then we have telemedicine available to our clients uh, to help them with medication refills or just help them with the non-urgent things. But most veterinarians are open, again, just for that emergent and, uh, and urgent care. Okay, tell us about the situation there uh, at the SPCA in terms of, you know, all the dogs and cats that you had there. I mean, from what I understand is most of the, you're, you're, you don't really have any animals left there. Most of the animals are out now, right? They are. I have Misha here on my lap. She's one of the few cats that we still have uh, on the premises. Uh, most of our dogs are in foster care. We have a few that um, have some medical needs that are here. Um, and we're looking to uh, adopt or foster out the rest of the cats that are on the premises. But again, everything, you know, everything that we're doing is with in mind with uh, slowing down the spread of uh, COVID. So um, we're being very, very cautious in all our protocols. But luckily, most of our animals are, are in homes at this point. That's really lovely to hear that people are taking care of them. And I get, you know what, that, that relationship of get them getting comfort from those animals and l reducing their own stress too by having somebody loving, somebody to yeah. love at home too, that must be wonderful. And this is a great time to really bond with your animals as well, right? You know, it's um, it's a really great time. You know, the sad thing is this is a great time to adopt, but it's not the right, you know, in, in terms of the interactions, we have to be extremely cautious. Again, slowing down the, the spread of corona is our number one priority. Um, but yeah, the dogs and cats are pretty psyched that we're home and, and with them during this time. Yeah, that they are. Thank you, Dr. Scarlett. We appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Just soothing to see that cat there in her arms. Even more of the country now under shelter at home orders. Take a look. The yellow states on the map all have partial shelter at home orders. That's Oklahoma, Maine, and Alabama among the latest. The red states on the map, you'll see it there coming in a second, uh, including California. There it is, have statewide restrictions. Coronavirus spreading rapidly in two popular U.S. destinations. New York, as you know, nearly 400 people have died from the virus there. Equally troubling, the number of patients hospitalized in New York went up 40 percent in just a day. In New Orleans and the surrounding areas, people are bracing for the worst there. Louisiana's governor says his state is experiencing the fastest coronavirus spread in the world. That puts the state on a similar trajectory to Italy and Spain, which have been devastated by the virus. Now, after the break, passing the time during the pandemic, our Janelle Wang shows us what we're all up to while we're sheltering at home. I'm Janelle Wang, working at home and sheltering at home, and I ask viewers to send me pictures of how they are staying active and healthy, and we want to show you some of those photos right now. This first picture from Milpitas, it's Monolito M. He's gardening, and he has a huge orange tree in his backyard, and he picked all his oranges and made freshly squeezed orange juice since we all need our vitamin C, especially during this time. Next photo, Cindy B. She's getting her exercise in with her fiance on the rooftop of their place in Emeryville. You can see they've got their yoga mat set up and even kettle weights, so go Cindy. And check out this video. Vivian of San Ramon sent this to me. Zumba with her neighbors, keeping their social distance. They are all doing Zumba in front of their own homes with the music blaring. As for my workout today, I tried jump roping for the first time in years, and I have to admit that didn't last very long. Jump roping is hard. Yeah. I can't do it for very long. <laughs> Did you so, do double dodge? I'm trying to stay active and do something different every day. 
<laughs> no way. That's impossible. <laughs> we were talking about that. I actually need more grown-ups here to do that. But yeah. I want to see what you guys are doing to stay active and healthy. Send me your photos on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and we will show them on TV. We'll try to get as much on as possible. Back and, to you guys. And tomorrow we'll see the video of Janelle trying to jump rope. That's the deal, right? Working out at home is hard because you get distracted. Like, I'll do oh, a little workout right, and then no. I load the dishwasher. There's no video of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Janelle. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> well, all schools in Sonoma County, this is a no surprise, will now be closed through April. Sonoma County is now joining Alameda, Contra Costa, Marin, San Mateo, San Francisco, and Santa Clara counties. All of them announced that online learning, though, will continue. While the lack of travelers has SFO streamlining operations during this crisis, this is a live look at the airport. Starting April 1st, the International Terminal will be consolidated into a single concourse. The boarding area will be closed and all travelers will begin using Area G. Airport leaders say for now, this is the way it's going to be until the end of May. We're back with more in a moment.